From drugs to alcohol to more violent crimes, the NFL has certainly seen its fair share of troubling action. The wide receiver fired from the Las Vegas Raiders wearing a neck brace, charged with multiple felony counts, including a DUI in the fatal high-speed crash. Interestingly, it seems like there is a certain group of franchises whose players always seem to be the ones getting in trouble. We'll start off with the Atlanta Falcons, the organization that had perhaps the most infamous arrest in NFL history. That of course being when its star quarterback and one of the biggest names in sports at the time, Michael Vick, caught charges for running Bad News Kennel, which turned out to be an illegal dogfighting ring. Now, this franchise is no stranger to chaos, and shockingly, Vic was not the only Falcons player to get caught up in animal abuse. Back in 2015, linebacker Prince Shembo was charged with aggravated animal cruelty after his girlfriend's dog died from blunt force trauma. There have also been a number of issues within the organization around drugs and alcohol perhaps because of the Atlanta nightlife scene. In fact, over 21% of the team's arrests have been for either DUI or drug charges. The New York Giants are another organization, which, like the Falcons, doesn't have the highest number of total arrests or anything like that, but seems to continually have high profile and honestly downright bizarre legal challenges. Like when one of its Super Bowl heroes, Plaxico Burris, was arrested after accidentally shooting himself in the thigh in a New York City club, which was truly one of the weirder stories the NFL has ever seen. Or when DeAndre Baker was accused of armed robbery in Miramar, Florida after he allegedly held up people at a friend's barbecue for their cash and jewelry. Those charges were eventually dropped, however, when it was discovered that Baker was in fact being extorted. The Giants have also had a couple of uglier domestic violent related arrests, with guys like Michael Bowie, Josh Brown, and most recently Cam Moore. The Kansas City Chiefs clearly have their own issues with keeping players out of trouble off the field, and it's far from a recent trend. This is in large part because it appears to be an organizational philosophy to take chances on guys with checkered pass. You know, so long as their talent on the football field makes them a worthwhile risk to take. I think on every player that you bring into the organization, that there is some element of risk. Chiefs owner Clark Hunt told reporters, it could be his playing ability, it could be things that distract him off the field, as well as trouble that they get into. That's a risk you could take. It's something that, as a franchise, we have to be willing to own when it doesn't go the right way. And that's something that I believe. The philosophy has continually set them up to have legal issues running amok in the organization. Take for example when they took Tyree Kill in the fifth round of the 2016 draft because his draft stock had plummeted after he had pled guilty to charges around a domestic dispute with his pregnant girlfriend. Lo and behold, just a few years later, Hill ended up in hot water again after reports surfaced that he had broken his three-year-old son's arm while disciplining him, and that he was threatening his fiance to be terrified of him. And yeah, it was the same woman from the incident that took place while he was at Oklahoma State. Hill is just the tip of the iceberg in Kansas City, too. There was the Kareem Hunt fiasco in 2018, when a videotape surfaced of him kicking a woman who was on the ground in a Cleveland hotel. Or when backup defensive lineman Roy Miller caught domestic violence charges. It's that kind of evaluation process that has had the Chiefs floating around the top of the NFL arrest leaderboard since the 2000s. Staying in the AFC West, with one of two teams that had more arrests since 2000 than the Chiefs, the Denver Broncos. In fact, only only the Minnesota Vikings have had more legal issues than Denver. And I suppose it shouldn't be that much of a surprise, considering again how these things sort of trickle down. And when you have John Elway, the face of the organization, bailing his son out of jail for assault and disturbing the peace charges, well, it sort of sets the tone for the organization. Some of the issues we've seen in Denver, though, have been rather trivial, like when former quarterback Jake Plummer received murky misdemeanor summons after allegedly kicking someone else's truck during a very he-said-she-said type of road rage incident. Similarly, perhaps the Broncos' most notable recent run-in with the law came back in 2021, when Bradley Chubb, Denver's extremely talented linebacker, got arrested for failure to appear in court following a minor traffic infraction. That's not to say that it's all trivial in the Mile High City, though. According to USA Today, 24.1% of the arrests that Broncos have had since 2000 have been for domestic violence, which is clearly a very serious matter. As for the team, that stands alone with the most 
arrest since 2000, the Vikings, well, they also own the title for most unique arrest, if you want to call it that. This, of course, is referencing the now infamous party boat scandal, which resulted in four Vikings catching misdemeanor charges after an October boat cruise on Lake Minnesota went haywire. It does seem like the need to party, perhaps as a coping mechanism for the brutal Minnesotan winters, is a long-standing issue for the Vikings, as just over 38% of the team's arrests since 2000 have been for DUIs. The most notable arrest, however, was a much darker allegation, and it involved one of the organization's best players of all time, Adrian Peterson, who back in 2014 caught charges of reckless or negligent injury to a child after authorities pegged him for hitting his four-year-old son with a switch. Peterson was able to strike a plea deal, pleading no contest to misdemeanor reckless assault. But that didn't change the public perception, and because of his superstar status, it sent ripples through the NFL and the wider sports media world, further damaging the Vikings' reputation. Speaking of terrible reputation, how could we not bring up the Cincinnati Bengals, who I was honestly shocked to learn weren't standing alone at the top of the list of NFL arrests. There was a stretch there where it really felt like you couldn't go two weeks without hearing about another Bengals player having a run-in with the law. That was in large part because the organization took chance after chance after chance on the infamously troubled but very talented cornerback Adam Pacman Jones. I mean, Jones alone had four arrests during his tenure in Cincy. But like Kansas City, Cincinnati has no one to blame but themselves because they continually took chances on Jones and other players with similar proclivities for legal woes. Guys like Chris Henry and Cedric Benson, multiple offenders who for one reason or another could not stay out of trouble. The situation in Cincinnati has been pretty depressing to be honest, especially because violent charges like assault and battery make up 24% of the transgressions. Not that you want any sort of legal issues, but there is undeniably a darker undertone when the crimes are in that realm. Cincinnati's divisional rival, the Baltimore Ravens, are another one of those teams that have built up this kind of negative reputation over the years, dating all the way back to the early 2000s, when arguably the franchise's most important and well-known player, Ray Lewis, was implicated in the deaths of two men that took place outside of a nightclub in Atlanta the night of the Super Bowl. Somehow, he only pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice, catching probation and a hefty fine from the NFL, but the crime was never actually resolved resolved, leading many to wonder, and some to believe, that he may have actually been guilty of the original charges. Those early 2000s Ravens really set the tone for the organization, as a few of their other prominent players like Jamal Lewis, Terrell Suggs, and Steve McNair all caught charges of their own. And the shadow that formed over the franchise, and really the NFL as a whole, darkened with the mishandling of the Ray Rice arrest that took place in 2014. He shocked the football world by coming out of Rutgers to become an All-Pro and a Super Bowl champion despite being rather undersized for the professional level. Not to mention that he'd garnered a reputation for being one of the most charitable players in the NFL and was deeply involved in giving back to the Baltimore community, making this situation all the more tragic because it all came crashing down when he was arrested for a physical altercation that took place with his then fiance and now wife, Janae Palmer, at the Revel Casino in Atlantic City. The two were heavily intoxicated and got into an argument, which turned physical, causing the NFL to suspend Rice for the first two games of the 2014 season. And for a moment, it felt like this was just going to be another murky NFL crime that disappeared into the annals of time. But that all changed when TMZ leaked a video that showed Rice dragging his un conscious fiancé out of the elevator. The NFL ultimately turned Ray Rice into an example, and largely changed the way it handled these kinds of situations. Commissioner Goodell even publicly admitted that he didn't get it right, and announced that the NFL would be lengthening its suspensions for domestic violence incidents. However, none of the three parties, the NFL's, the Ravens, and Rice's reputations were ever the same, and Rice became a sacrificial lamb in cleaning up the NFL and never played another snap of professional football again. 
Unfortunately, that hasn't really solved the NFL's arrest problem in the way that the league office wants you to think. Just ask the Las Vegas Raiders. Under the Davis family's ownership, the team has had all sorts of issues, but most recently, it was when the team's former first-round pick, Henry Ruggs III, got behind the wheel of his Corvette while drunk and crashed, going an estimated 156 miles per hour, killing an innocent woman in the process. Truly tragic. Then, to make matters worse for the organization, a mere two months later, one of its players, Nate Hobbs, had another DUI. In this case, he was just found asleep behind the wheel in the early hours in the morning. So, this is not to conflate the two situations, but still. This was horrible optics, and shows that the team clearly didn't do enough to address its players' behavior afterwards. Last, but certainly not least, we have the San Francisco 49ers and the Dallas Cowboys, who under morally bankrupt ownership have undeniably been two of the most controversial teams in all of sports. Back in the 90s, both Dallas and San Fran built dynasties off of extremely talented but legally challenged and in some cases borderline disturbed players. Dallas in particular, because some of the stories that came out of those admittedly dominant mid-90s Dallas teams are absolutely preposterous. And in the time since, both teams have followed pretty similar trajectories. Neither has been able to reclaim their glory days, though both organizations seem desperate to do so, even if that means remaining steadfast and taking chances on players with ugly arrest records. Like Reuben Foster and Alden Smith for San Fran, and Joseph Randall and Greg Hardy for Dallas. To me, this all ties back to the owners. The Niners have been passed through the DeBartolo family for generations, which has some pretty deep mob ties, and plenty of its own skirmishes with the law. And Jerry Jones, well, not much really needs to be said about his moral shortcomings. What NFL team do you think gets in trouble the most, though? Did we miss anyone? Join us in the comments section below. If you liked this video and learned a thing or two, clicking the like button helps out a ton. And hey, we appreciate it. If this is your first time coming around to TPS, though, subscribing is a great idea, because we put out videos like this every single day. But as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you guys next time.